We are recording. Uh, uh, everybody, welcome to today's class. We have the the honor to have a wonderful guest tonight, which is tonight in Italy. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I think a late morning uh, in yeah. uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, our guest uh, tonight is Molly Wright Stinson. Molly is a senior associate dean for research, uh, the College of Fine Arts in Carnegie Mellon University. Is the KNL Gates Associate Professor of Ethics and Computational Technology and Associate Professor in the School of Design, still there at Carnegie Mellon uh, in Pittsburgh. She is the author of uh, Architectural in Intelligence: How Design and Architect Created the Digital Landscape, which is. Uh, I think uh, it's a fundamental book for the argument that we are dealing with this year, and, and I think it's uh, it, it's become very very um, actual in in the contemporary discourse, uh, uh, and it's very poignant. I mean, it, it came out like three years ago, 2017, if I'm correct. Uh, so it's not. Uh, I mean, it depends on on, uh, on the times of, of our contemporary society. For certain things, three years is a lot. Uh, for others, three years is nothing. But I think, uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I think it's totally relevant, uh, no matter its issue date, <laughs> in any case. Um, she, in this book, she explores the radical history of design, and I think uh, you will be talking uh, about that in particular. Uh, for architecture, AI and cybernetics from the 50s to the current uh, day. So I won't be spending uh, any more words for that because I want uh, uh, we have the author here. So it's uh, it's very <laughs> it's so much better to hear it from her own words. Uh, she has a PhD from Princeton University in architecture and a master's in environmental design from Yale. And she was a resident professor at the Interaction Design Institute in Ivrea here in Italy uh, for a while, uh, where she led the Connected Community Research Group. I have to say that in, in, the, in those years, early 2003, late 2004, I still was in my infancy of studying the, this kind of things. Uh, so it, it, it was really something to discover that you were actually teaching there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting things happened in, in, uh, at the Uh, her career is so uh, massive that uh, she, she deserves <laughs> much more time for that, but uh, I want to keep it short and sweet if possible. Uh, she also worked with uh, web companies and technologies since 1984 with Reuters, Scient, uh, Netscape, and Razorfish, among others. 94, not 84. Uh, 94. Sorry, my, my bad. Oh, 84. Man. I was. I was. Uh, I was still quite young. <laughs> man, man, I, I had the, the year. My I pronounced it wrong. Uh, she co-founded also Maxi, which is an award-winning women, women's webzine still in the 90s. And it, now, as a design researcher, she examines her, uh, the effect of personal technology and digital media on the including projects that she did in India and China for Microsoft Research and R&D Associate uh, for Intel Research. R-E-D Associate, sorry, for Intel Research. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to give uh, the floor to Molly for her presentation. And again, we are humbled and honored to have you, Molly. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm excited to be here. I only wish that I could be with you um, in Bologna. And instead of uh, instead of here in uh, Pittsburgh, it's funny actually because I was um, telling a friend about the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea the oh. other day, and so I have the Amano oh. here from 2003, and I have Jan Christoph Zöls, who's from Experientia, the um, design firm in in uh, Italy, uh, mm -hmm. the mobile embodiments book he put together. So they're they're right here at hand. It doesn't feel like that long ago, but it was that experience of being at um, at Ibrea and living in Gabetti and Isola buildings and working in the uh, the Olivetti R and D facility building, um, which was the Blue House for Ibrea, that um, that really had a huge impact on me and made me come back to the United States and do a PhD in architecture, um, because as you of course know. Um, 
designers in Italy are um, are architects, and it just fundamentally changed how I saw the world. Um, and uh, so part of what what came now and and what came in this book is an answer, a historical answer to what uh, some of the things that I learned then. And um, I, I you, I'm really happy that you started with this idea that you know how new is three years ago or how new really is AI. Um, I like to collect examples of this. So AI is the new. If we Google. We see a lot of different opportunities or different possibilities. AI is the new electricity, the new future, the new UI, the new beast. Here we see AI is the new black. AI is the new user interface. AI is the next digital frontier. AI is the new space race and the US needs a new Sputnik moment. This one got a lot of a lot of play. AI is the new electricity. And in this one, I just pulled up an MIT technology review article and highlighted the word new. And there were six versions of it on or six instances of it on the first um, screen. And I think one of them doesn't count because it was New York, but still a lot of new when we talk about AI. Google's AI is a new paradigm that unites humans and machines. And this is a very sexist ad for a new AI enabled um, web design platform. And apparently I'm even the new AI according to this. Um, the fact is that AI isn't the new anything. And I think that probably your class knows this because AI isn't new. And um, I want to also add one more thing about this before I move forward. I'm doing a study right now about how AI and ethics um, is characterized in the media. And it turns out that every time we write about AI, we write about the word new. New is one of the top 10 words that goes along with AI and any other kind of technology um, when, when we write about it. But let's talk about how not new it is. So John McCarthy in 1955 coined the term artificial intelligence. And by definition, um, the definition he gave then was making machines do things that were, would require intelligence if done by people. But he, and then he gathered a group of people later that summer for the Dartmouth conference um, and spent the summer looking at different aspects on what artificial intelligence could be. And um, in the letter that he wrote to the people that he convened to work on these questions, um, he wrote, every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So key, a couple of key ideas here about AI. Um, one is this idea of simulation and the other is this idea of learning. And learning goes back certainly before here. Um, one idea or one one instance of this comes from Alan Turing and um, the Turing test or what was called the imitation game in 1950. He wrote, I propose to consider the question, can a machine think? So this is five years before um, before John McCarthy. Here's Arthur, Arthur Samuel and his idea of machine learning, which we still think of as related to um, artificial intelligence, it, he uh, characterized it as the programming of a digital computer to behave in a way which, if done by human beings or animals, would be described as involving the process of learning. So we've seen the process of learning, this idea that something starts small and grows up in the amount that it learns being central to um, how we have ideas of machine intelligence. And what you see he's doing here is he's playing checkers. Um, he fed this particular um, computer that you see here um, a bunch of chess moves, a bunch of, of uh, moves of chess games, and he's playing against this computer. Um, or excuse me, I'm sorry, he's not playing chess, he's playing checkers. These two gentlemen are playing chess. This is Alan Newell and Herb Simon. 
um, very famous professors from my university, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, which at that point in time was called Carnegie Tech. And games like checkers and chess were important for figuring out moves and how, um, how ideas of intelligence could evolve. We see them now with the game of Go. And maybe some of you have seen the AlphaGo documentary that came out a couple of years ago. Excuse me. And Simon and Newell and their collaborator, J.C. Shaw, wrote in 1958 that they thought they were going to be very close to figuring out how to use a computer to simulate human intelligence. They wrote, intuition, insight, and learning are no longer exclusive possessions of humans. Any large high-speed computer can be programmed to exhibit them also. And um, they thought by about 1960, they would be able to simulate the workings of um, a human brain. And on one hand, maybe that sounds naive, but on the other hand, I think that sometimes, um, I think that often when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we are using the best technology we have at a given time to simulate or model what we think of as intelligence. So when they were using something called the general problem solver, that was introducing their best technology at the time. Now we might be doing deep learning or, um, or other kinds of technologies that are probably outside of my knowledge base to know about um, in terms of how we are simulating, um, simulating intelligence. I like this particular description. This is from a New York Times article in 1958 um, and it was the introduction of the perceptron. And um, this New York Times article, uh, it reports that the Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. The Navy said that the perceptron would be the first non-living mechanism able uh, capable of receiving, recognizing, and identifying its surroundings without any human training or control. And perceptrons are early versions of neural networks. So this is um, again another, another entity in the 1950s that we're talking about as being capable of learning, reproducing itself, even potentially having consciousness. We could see someone like JCR Licklider in 1960. And um, I'll say more about JCR Licklider and his role um, in, in technology uh, in just a couple minutes. But let's stick with this idea that he introduced in 1960 in a paper called Man Computer Symbiosis. Man Computer Symbiosis will involve very close coupling between the human and the electronic members of the partnership. And very frequently now, we hear of this idea of human computer symbiosis. Um, I was reading a proposal last week for uh, an NSF project, National Science Foundation project, um, that, uh, that was for an AI center, and it used this word symbiosis. That word was originally used here by Licklider in 1960, and that was 60 years ago. This notion of symbiosis, the idea that humans and computers together would be better than the sum of their parts, is um, has been the operative idea for interactivity for decades and for AI, and it still is now. And then we have Marvin Minsky. And uh, he wrote in 1961 in a paper called Steps Toward Artificial Intelligence that I believe that we are on will be strongly influenced and quite possibly dominated by intelligent problem-solving machines. So I'll point out here that AI and architecture together is also not new, the combination of the two. And that's what I focused on in, um, in my book. And I looked at the work of four um, architects, in particular, Christopher Alexander, Cedric Price, Richard Solwerman, and Nicholas Negroponte and his work with the MIT Architecture Machine Group, which later became the MIT Media Lab that's still in operation today. Um, I want to point out that these men worked with other groups of people um, who realized a lot of their work. I tended to write about a lot of white men. Um, there weren't only white men in the picture. And in fact, if any of this research is interesting to you, 
I would suggest looking at the collaborators and um, different organizations that these people worked in um, for more for more of a look at the women and potentially the people of color who were involved in their work. So there are four, four key questions that um, architectural intelligence asks. Um, it looks at why the work of Price, Alexander Werman, uh, Negroponte, and then the field of information architecture um, that was developing in the 90s in the United States and Europe, uh, that the ways that it shifted the boundaries of architecture in foundational ways. It traces how defense funding simultaneously shaped both architectural and AI research. It looked at what computation and AI researchers gained by engaging with architects and architecture. And it also looked at how architecture became useful territory for the imagination of new digital worlds. So I'm gonna go into the work of uh, a couple of different um, architects in this in the book. I'm going to skip Richard Saul Werman, but I'm going to take a look at Christopher Alexander. And if we were all in the same room right now, I'd put up my I'd, I'd ask all of you who here is familiar with Christopher Alexander. Is there a way that I can find out? I, I don't know if there is a way, but um, sometimes I find that people know him. And sometimes I find that people don't know him. Do you have a sense? I'm not sure if they know about Christopher Alexander because um, the education of my students, uh, it's pretty much on the traditional side of architectural learning. Yeah. And there is very little in the way of uh, relation between architecture and computing. There are some of my TC students that probably have become familiar with Christopher Alexander. Yeah. But I'm not sure uh, so how much. When, um... When I came back from Italy in 2004 and I told my family that I was going to go to architecture school, this is what they gave me. <laughs> in fact, I got a copy from my, uh, from my mother and stepfather and I got a copy from my boyfriend at the time. And this is Christopher Alexander's book. He's, um, he's interesting. He's one of the best known architects of all time for non-architects and he has a contentious relationship with architects. So um, some of this, some of his work is computational, some of his impact on computation. Um, and yeah, he is, he is sometimes contentious. So, so I'll introduce him here and then I'll talk about his impact on, um, on different areas of computation. Christopher Alexander defined how engineers, computer scientists, developers, and UX designers talk about architecture. He used computation and concepts from early AI in his work, and his work continues to influence computer science and everyday practices in programming today. He's best known for uh, three books. Notes on the Synthesis of Form um, was his dissertation, the published version of his dissertation at the University of Cambridge in 1964, or I'm sorry, I'm, I'm completely wrong. He, his dissertation was at Harvard. He did his undergraduate studies at Cambridge. So 1964, Harvard. And then um, he did a lot of other work in the meantime. He came to Berkeley. He became a professor at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. And with his colleagues in the Center for Environmental Structure, he published a book called A Pattern Language, which is this very thick book that I have right here. Um, so with Sarah Ishikawa, Marie Silverstein, Max Jacobson, Ingrid Fixtal King, and Shlomo Angel. And then um, he wrote The Timeless B Way of Building two years later, which is sort of a philosophy um, of the patterns in a pattern language. And I just want to point out how early the computational work um, arises in Alexander's work. So as an undergraduate at Cambridge, he studied both mathematics and architecture. Um, he was there around the same time as Peter Eisenman. He was born in 1936. So he's, I guess, what, 84, 85, 86 years old right about now, um, still alive. And um, and he spent his early career trying to use 
computers to sort out design problems, working them out into requirements so that they could be um, better solved, right? Find ways to use computation to figure out how the relationships between different entities of things. Um, gave up on that and then founded uh, founded the work that became a pattern language. But I want to point out in notes on the synthesis of form, which um, is an interesting read, at least for its footnotes. This is where I first became acquainted with, it's the first time I found an architect, I should say, working with artificial intelligence. Um, at the end of the first uh, chapter, his last paragraph of his first chapter, he wrote, we must face the fact that we are on the brink of times when man may be able to magnify their intellectual and inventive capability, just as in the 19th century, they used machines to magnify their physical capacity. Again, as then, our innocence is lost. And again, of course, the innocence once lost cannot be regained. The loss demands attention, not denial. And this sounds like the kind of thing that a lot of us are saying today as we look at the, the impact of technologies on our life. Um, a lot of the critique against it is about this question of what we're losing against what we're gaining. But here in particular, he was referring to Marvin Minsky, Steps Toward Artificial Intelligence, which I included at the beginning, as well as um, a text by Claude Shannon and John McCarthy and Ross Ashby, who is a cyberneticist who was involved in early, uh, early work in AI. So this is how I made my way into artificial intelligence and it was on Alexander's mind um, back then. So I'm jumping ahead to 1977 to a pattern language. Um, and there is a lot more to say about his his um, career, but I'll, I'll stick with this kind of mid area of it. And here's what uh, he defines, he and his co colleagues define a pattern as being. Each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment and then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. And each pattern looks sort of like this. Um, there are, and in fact, I'll show you just how many patterns there are in a minute. But there's a headline and a number. That asterisk you see here means that this, that Alexander and his colleagues felt very good about this pattern. They felt like it was a very strong pattern. Um, there's a photograph to provide a visual reference. There's a problem statement that you see, and there are sketches that bring to life this problem of how to design row houses, so houses that are right next to each other. Um, and then all patterns exist in a hierarchy. So for instance, this is, this is part of it. Um, that hierarchy of patterns. And all patterns also connect to other patterns. It's almost like they're hyperlinked. So if you are, if you're reading this pattern and you get to the end, it will refer you to a couple of other patterns to consider. And the patterns that are above and below or in the section that you're looking at for your design project might be useful. So if you're looking at, at a house, these, these um, patterns from 136 to 152 might be useful to you um, as you consider how best to set up the space. And here are some more patterns in the hierarchy. And basically the patterns operate like a network. Um, they work from large to small scale. And then the book, um, the book, The Timeless Way of Being is a philosophy of patterns of what it means to work within those patterns as a design system. And they even, the Center for Environmental Structure, which is the, the center that Alexander co-founded at Berkeley, um, had an idea as early as 1967. This is a pamphlet from when, a draft of a pamphlet when they were launching the center that I pulled up at Berkeley. And um, they even have an idea that you could use a computer then to store these patterns. And then what you could do is you could write in or call the Center for Environmental Structure and they'd give you patterns for your project and answer questions. Um, and as they, as they put it, a user who maintains access to the computer will always have the entire pattern language at their fingertips in its latest stage of evolution. Keep that idea in mind because it actually does come to life in, uh, in something that was inspired by Christopher Alexander that you will know. 
So now looking into the world of technology, I want to introduce you to Ward Cunningham and Kent Beck. Neither of these guys are architects, although they liked architecture and they spent a lot of time looking at Alexander's expensive books in the university bookstore and library. Um, in the late 1980s, they were developing a programming language called Smalltalk, and they were trying to um, they were trying to keep in mind their interface design conventions. They're developing a user interface, and they thought, "Hey, patterns! That idea of a pattern of that headline and and some language explaining what something is that would be really good for this." for these objects that we're, de we're designing in our programming language. So this is an object-oriented programming language, um, and I think probably a lot of you who do any kind of programming are familiar with them. It's uh, the, programming par the programming language paradigm behind a lot of things that you would be using today, whether you know it or not. So they published this in, um, they, they incorporated patterns into Smalltalk, and they began sharing this idea with other people. And eventually in 1994, these four people, Eric Gamma, uh, Richard Helm, Ralph Johnson, and John Blissides, created something called Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software. You see this network of patterns that link together, and it's not unlike that drawing we saw from Alexander um, in Timeless Wave Building a couple of years before. And all of these relate to each other, and they, they make it easier for you to program object-oriented languages. And as Kent Beck says about these modes of, um, of thinking and Alexander's impact, the architect Alexander on these technologists, he said that it's a rearrangement of the political power in the design and building process. And it also influenced um, the agile software development uh, method. If any of you have done any <clears throat> programming um, any time recently in a tech company, um, you're probably familiar with scrums and um, different agile methods. And that's what this is. It is directly influenced by Christopher Alexander's ideas about patterns and design processes being open and malleable. And there's another place that this, um, that this comes up. Ward Cunningham invented the wiki. The wiki is the um, wikis are the format, the the kind of technology format that runs things like Wikipedia. Um, and Ward Cunningham never patented it. He came up with it in 1994 on Hyper HyperCard for Apple, ported it to the web in 1995, and he wanted to have a conversation that never stopped. It just continued growing from the center out. So that idea is Wikipedia. And, um, and we see today in Wikipedia. And I think that when, when I look back to that pamphlet that I showed you, um, let's see if I can get back there quickly. This idea here, a user who maintains access to the computer will always have the entire pattern language at their fingertips, <coughs> I think is sort of the idea that we get to today with, um, with Wikipedia and with the wiki and the ideas that Ward Cunningham had. So interestingly, in I'm gonna jump back in time a little bit to 1996, October 96, and the Object-Oriented Programming Language Conference was taking place in San Jose, California, and they invited Christopher Alexander, the architect, to come and talk to this group of software architects, and they did, and I've been struck by these words that he said, because again, he was talking about the stakes of computation. And what he said to those engineers then was, you almost can't name a facet of the world which is not already to some very strong degree under the influence of the programs that are being written to manage and control those entities or those operations. So calling out the fact that what these engineers were doing um, really did take into account a much bigger architectural impact than they might have thought of just being programmers sitting at terminals somewhere. So that's a tiny sliver of Christopher Alexander's long and sometimes problematic career. But what I wanted to outline here is architecture's influence on computation and digital culture, the way that he developed an operating language for architecture, this question of many architects particularly in the US, but many architects dislike Alexander and refuse to even consider his work. 
I wonder whether they should reconsider him on one hand. And then on the other, I wonder why are we talking about Christopher Alexander in 2020? And why are we not talking about his collaborators, um, people like Sarah Ishikawa, who is his second in command? Um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to open things up. I will mention I have a piece that just came out in volume that is uh, in the newest issue. And uh, it's, it's a problematic piece about Christopher Alexander. So I'm happy to send that your way. So now I'd like to talk about Cedric Price. And um, Cedric Price has really great sunglasses here. Um, he's better known for things he designed and did not build than things that he did. He is perhaps best known for the Fun Palace, which he designed with the theater director, Joan Littlewood. She was a radical theater director. She was a protege of Bertolt Brecht, the German playwright. And they wanted to create a space, a learning space, a cybernetic theater, um, something that would learn from the people in it and begin to respond to it over time. Um, this would have been in London in 1963, and the eventual um, place that they had tried to get it built is um, the former Olympic grounds. And if you've been to the Bartlett's uh, Near East or Here East facility in London, that's where this is now. They worked with the 27 member cybernetic committee that had everybody major in cybernetics as a part of, um, of, of as a part of it. And they had this idea here about how the building would modify people. So if you look in the middle, you'll see um, a square that says, let's see if I can get my my pointer on it, input of mod unmodified people and then output of modified people. So the building in Cedric Price's work, there are all these different examples where he thinks of buildings as, as kind of large scale computers. And um, this one would have been there to um, figure out what people wanted and, and interact and give them something back. This is an image from his um, proposed but never built project generator from 1976 to 1979. And it was supposed to be an arts retreat center in um, in Georgia, that state that we're waiting to hear <laughs> whether it went for Trump or Biden right now, um, right on the border of Georgia and Florida. His client was Howard Gilman um, from the Gilman Paper Company, a patron of the arts and of ballet and of cardiology. Um, and this was supposed to be a set of cubes and barriers and walkways that could be combined and taken apart and that could be there to support whatever activity people might want to engage with here. One thing that's really important about Cedric Price is that he didn't believe that architecture should be predetermined. He believed that it should be there to make people want to change their minds, to support that. He felt that as an architect, it wasn't his job to lock something down. Um, he's more form famous for saying things like, maybe you don't need a new house to a client. Maybe you need a divorce. Maybe you need a walk in the park. Um, he, his end point wasn't necessarily building or building anything conventional. He liked uh, mobile cranes very much. So this would have been um, a three meter by three meter cube, set of cubes that would have been moved around on a grid and um, and they'd build up together. He realized after a couple of years that it was unlikely that he'd be able to get people to make the changes to generator that he wanted to. And so he started collaborating with two computer scientist architects, John Frazier and Julia Frazier, a couple. And they worked with him on, um, on a set of programs and proposals for generators. So they proposed putting a set of microcontrollers on each of generators parts. I'll remind you, this is 1978 that they're coming up with this. So this is 42 years ago. So put micro microcontrollers on each of generators parts and then run a series of programs. Um, that would let you know what all of the rules were for the design of generator, that would know where all the parts were at all times. Um, this is this what you see here is a modeling kit for trying out generators parts, these plexiglass 
cubes and by moving them around, they would plot both on the monitor and the printer, the plotter, and then they could be printed out and handed off to the mobile crane operator to move around generators parts. And there was a fourth program, um, the boredom program. This is my favorite one. In the event of generators parts not being moved around, um, or as, as uh, John and Julia Frazier wrote, in the event of the site not being reorganized or changed for some time, the computer starts generating unsolicited plans and improvements based on previous successful ones. And what they wrote to Cedric Price is if you kick a system, the very least that you would expect it to do is kick you back. And then I found this little postscript in, in the archives that, uh, that says something I think really important. And they said, you seem to imply that we were only useful if we produce results that you did not expect. I think this leads to some definition of computer aids in general. At least one thing that you would expect from any half decent program is that it should produce at least one plan which you did not expect. So it's a quite a different idea than using, uh, using a design program to do your bidding and to engage in the master slave dialogue that um, other computer science at the time, scientists at the time suggested we should use. That is very, very problematic, especially from today's perspective. Um, that this idea here is that a system kicks you back and challenges you and makes you see things you might not have seen otherwise. And I'll say that um, I'm going to skip over this because I can't be certain that it's going to play properly. But these ideas of boredom programs come up time and time again um, in in work, in architecture, and in robotics, that things get bored of you and you have to find ways to interact with them again. Um, I'd consider Madeline Gannon's work in this capacity, um, and I'm, I don't want to have the video not work, so I'll skip it, but she uses some of these ideas today. You are welcome to, fr to try it if you want. Shall we try? Okay, yeah, we'll try. Why not? Why not? I mean, okay. no pressure. <laughs> All right, so Madeline Gannon got her PhD from Carnegie Mellon um, a couple of years ago in architecture, and she uh, trains, she calls herself a robot whisperer. She trains large scale robots to uh, interact with their audience in different kinds of ways. And uh, in doing so, it's her interest to get us to think creatively about how we engage with um, with uh, these these machines. So this particular machine you see here is in the Design Museum in London. Uh, originally, it came from a, uh, a an assembly line in Germany. It's back there now, but this is where it spent six months. And um, if this works out, you should see how it interacts with some young people. When everything comes together and you're in the space with the robot and you just have a very raw experience with this animal-like machine responding to your every move, all the technical aspects sort of melt away into the background. It's incredibly important to have opportunities and spaces to come in and experiment and misuse these existing technologies. So it's slowed a little bit, but you get an idea here of how uh, Mimas would zoom in and jump back and kids would play with her and um, try to engage her. And it's, it, Madeline was unaware of Cedric Price's work when she designed this, so it was interesting to be able to share that with her. All right. So Cedric Price, challenge everything. Challenge the architect, the designer, the inhabitant, the user, the building, the design process. And not just respond to change, but to but use architecture in order to generate change. And the question for which Cedric Price is most famous is the following. Technology is the answer. But what was the question? All right, I want to move on now to MIT's Architecture Machine Group, and which was in existence from 1967 to 1984. And then it became the MIT Media Lab, um, which is still in operation today. It became the what was the Architecture Machine Group folded into 
um, the Media Lab when it was founded. And the Architecture Machine Group did a good number of things. So it was half architects, half um, electrical engineers and programmers. And Nicholas Negroponti wrote in 19, uh, 1975 that the architecture machine has chronologically become a book, a mini computer, a family of mini computers, a small curriculum, a computer ethic, another book, and a catch-all for a variety of papers, which makes you wonder with all of that, what didn't the architecture machine group intend to do? And in Negroponte's first book, The Architecture Machine, he dedicated the book to the first machine that can appreciate the gesture. To the first machine that can appreciate the gesture. Um, it's probably been 12 or 15 years since I first read that book, and I still keep coming back to the implications of this statement and with some things that have happened in the more recent times of uh, MIT and the Media Lab and Marvin Minsky and Jeffrey Epstein, it makes me ask even more questions today. One of the things that's fascinating about the book, The Architecture Machine, which came out in 1970, is that Nicholas Negroponte basically put forward a theory of architecture machines, which is to say a theory of how we interact with intelligence, a theory of our interfaces to AI. And that broke down into a few things, this idea of human computer symbiosis or cooperation. So picking up that idea from JCR like Leiter from 1960 and applying it to our engagement with artificial intelligence. To systems that learn. Like the idea of learning again, but again, how, how does this happen at the scale of our, our bodies and our rooms and our interactions? Building models of the user for personalization. So it would be hard to imagine a non-personalized experience these days, although, you know, that's something we've been essentially building up for 25 years on the internet. But he had ideas about what a personalized interaction with AI might be in the 1970s high quality interfaces, both the inputs and the outputs. He challenged um, the, the status quo for what we used and thought that we should be using things that felt very natural and that felt very natural to be within. And then finally, that operate at an environmental scale, that is the world around us, so meso to macro. The first major project that the Architecture Machine Group did was called Urban 2, and then it became known as Urban 5 in 1967. It was a class and a research project sponsored by IBM and MIT. And Urban 5 was a, a design tool for cities um, with, again, using the idea of a cube, so 10 foot by 10 foot cubes. And um, the user would use a light pen working on a screen and then attribute various kinds of modes to those different cubes and saying what they would do. That's what you see on the left in that image. And then it would engage the user in a dialogue. So it's essentially um, a conversational user interface um, or a very, very, very early version of what we'd now call a chat bot for communicating about design decisions. So that's what you see here. And um, the, the project was both curricular and pedagogical. So it happened in the lab, as well as something that they just tried to produce. Um, and it wasn't very successful um, for a number of reasons. One of the things is that designing conversational user interfaces is hard. And if any of you have ever tried to do it, you know how hard it is. Um, so at the same period of time, for instance, um, the ELISA system had been developed in 1966 by Joseph Weizenbaum. It was a therapist program where you'd type your questions and the therapist would ask you questions in return, just sort of tell me about your mother, why do you feel the way you do, and so on and so forth. But um, Negroponte wrote in the architecture machine that urban ultimately printed garbage, but at least it was friendly garbage. So we see some of the limitations of these ideas that we're still exploring today. In 1970, um, in the software show, the Architecture Machine Group 
included introduced a project called Seek. And Seek is on the cover of the catalog from the show, which is what you see on the left. Um, and then the, the gatefold of, as well of the catalog. And Seek featured a five foot by seven foot pen filled with mirrored cubes. And there was um, a robotic, a little bit of a robotic arm that Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert had developed and that um, the architecture machine group was using here. And there were a set of programs that tried to stack and make order out of these blocks. And at the same time, the um, architecture machine group introduced a group of gerbils, which is what you see here, if you look at the front of um, this image and then the life in a computerized environment image. And the gerbils did what gerbils do, you know, nudge around the blocks and try to make homes in them. And it says here in the lower right corner, gerbils match wits with computer built environment. And um, I want to mention the software show had works from some 50 artists, artists, and it was a disaster. A lot of the computerized works failed. Um, a lot of them were, were just a mess. Um, you know, most of them didn't work at any given time. The show almost bankrupted the Jewish Museum, which is who was hosting the exhibition. It was supposed to follow on to the Smithsonian in uh, Washington DC that got canceled and seek itself was a disaster because um, as I've heard it tended to kill the gerbils and that's sad but it also I think demonstrates what was going on um, in this period of time it's kind of a, a fine point of what was going on in this point of time in research in artificial intelligence so at this point in time AI research was done in what were called micro worlds or blocks worlds. And they were called blocks worlds because they often used blocks because blocks are easy, right? So uh, a computer eye um, with a made of a video camera could find the edges of blocks or a robotic arm could stack blocks, right? Um, and that's, that's why we see these kind of small worlds where AI researchers were trying to work out some small aspect of them. The problem is when they scale the lessons up to a broader world, a bigger world, um, they didn't always work well. And the fact is that AI researchers knew this. So I'm going to share with you, the next screen is um, a quote from Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert in a, 19, uh, a 1970 report that they wrote about microworlds, they said each model or microworld, as we shall call it, is very schematic. It talks about a fairyland in which things are so simplified that almost every statement about them would be literally false if about the real world. We feel that they, microworlds, are so important that we are assigning a large portion of our effort in, this is the effort in the AI lab at MIT, toward developing a collection of these microworlds and finding out how to use the suggestive and predictive powers of the models without being overcome by their incompatibility with literal truth. So effectively, they're using something that is untrue to learn the small aspects at, at micro scale. But what gets lost on the way is what happens when we scale back up. The Architecture Machine Group over its lifespan did a lot of different things. I want to point out that in the 1970s, their work became increasingly funded by um, the by the military, the Department of Defense, um, in particular, the um, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and the Office of Naval Research. And this was everybody in the field of AI. You couldn't do basic uh, basic research and have it be funded by um, by the Department of Defense. You could only do applied research, so you had to show how your research or projects could be used in a military context. Um, and I, I think you know one one thing to point out here is that people moved back and forth between the military, the university, and private contracting. You remember JCR Licklider. Um, he was a part of the group that put in place the basis for the internet called ARPANET in 1967. He was a professor at MIT.
EFT, and he was a contractor as well at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. So people moved back and forth, and a very small world of people essentially um, greenlit and made these early AI projects come to fruition. Okay, so Aspen Movie Map was a project about remote sensing and um, the possibilities for, um, for remote military engagement. Um, at they, in order to do this project, they tied, um, they attached a film camera to a Jeep and drove it through Aspen, Colorado and recorded film. They saved that film to a video disc and then the Aspen movie map experience that you see in the upper left um, was uh, the user would sit in a Eames lounge chair that had joysticks and zoom down the street of Aspen, Colorado. And the images would be served by video disc. On the left and right are touch screens of maps. Um, one is a satellite view and one is a, um, a more schematic view. So it, a lot like Google Street View um, in the 1970s. And again, the purpose was um, for remote, uh, essentially the experience of remote sensing. And this was research that was funded for another 15 years through um, the Office of Naval Research and uh, DARPA into the early 1990s. And then on your right, mapping by yourself, um, were early thoughts about how augmented reality and digital mapping might work. Um, you see this gentleman in the lower right-hand corner holding, holding a window developed by Westinghouse that was intended to um, stand in for all of the maps in the battlefield uh, that a commander might have. Um, that's the, the exact wording. Um, these were two and two and a half and three dimensional digital layered maps that would be, they were exploring ideas of force feedback um, and audio and visual, um, audio and visual detail. And just for fun, um, Guy Weinsappel, who is the, the lead on the um, Mapping by Yourself project, had some good ideas for the form factors. So this is 19, eh, 1977 or so. Um, so you see the Scandinavian model, the folded sheet model, the military chic novel model, and then the Star Wars model. Star Wars had just come out. Negroponte wrote in his second book, Soft Architecture Machines, I strongly believe that it is very important to play with these ideas scientifically and explore applications of machine intelligence that totter between being unimaginably oppressive and unbelievably exciting. And again, this is another statement that I keep coming back to over and over because I think that it really does capture what it is to do work in this kind of setting, to do advanced technology work, certainly in 1975, but also in 2020. And if we look back to how he even thought of why machines would be intelligence, he connected it, this is Negroponte, he connected it to the idea of ethics. Um, this is the first page of the architecture machine. And he asked, why ask a machine to learn, to understand, to associate courses with goals, to be self-improving, to be ethical, in short, to be intelligent? Um, so I think that for Negroponte, intelligence was a matter of ethics and ethics is a matter of intelligence. And so this is what we what we begin to see coming out of the architecture machine group, among many other things, but interfaces for AI, intelligence and ethics, defense funded work, emerging of architecture and engineering, um, new modes of architectural research that had never existed before, um, bringing it in line with technology. But I want to point out that I also I can't talk about this work anymore without talking about recent events at the Media Lab uh, and some other questions about funding and research. And I find myself wondering how architecture and its relationship to computing is complicit in these questions about ethics. So if we're looking at the MIT Media Lab today, um, we can't not look at what happened with Jeffrey Epstein. and. Um, if this was a big story that broke here, um, Jeffrey Epstein is a convicted sex trafficker 
who it turned out had been um, donating money and contributing money at MIT and working very closely with Joey Ito, who's the director of, um, was the director of the MIT Media Lab for um, eight or nine years. Um, Joey Ito hid Jeffrey Epstein's contributions and what began to come to light is Jeffrey Epstein's role in a number of different kinds of relationships and contributions um, with folks at MIT. So again, computation has always highlighted the stakes of architecture. And architecture has always highlighted the stakes of competition, computation. But I wonder things like what's at stake in the long game. And another thing that I think needs to be pointed out about Jeffrey Epstein is that he was very close friends with Marvin Minsky. And one of the one of the women who um, was a victim of Jeffrey Epstein in her deposition um, alleges that she was made to have sex with Marvin Minsky when he was 73 years old and she was 17. Um, so this is the, the kind of question that I begin to have about um, power, ethics, technology, and sex is what is the long game and what's at stake and what role might we be playing in architecture and design that we didn't realize. Herb Simon, again, um, the chess player that you saw at the beginning of this talk, um, said, to design is to devise courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And I'd like to know who defines what is preferred. You know, ultimately, we could even be talking about futures of architecture. And I love ending on this note because it has nothing to do with what I've shown you so far. That when we talk about intelligence and newness, we're always talking about the architecture of the future. And yet this very quote I'm showing you is referring to this work, right? To someone like Julien Guadet in 1886, talking about his work with the Hotel des Postes. So, I think we have these interesting notions of past, present, and future, um, the longevity of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, play, but again, coming back to that question of stakes, um, I do really wonder what the stakes are in, in the longer term in these, uh, in these kinds of explorations we do and the kind of work we do. So I will stop there. Thank you. Molly, thank you very much. This was a, an amazing presentation, amazing lecture with so many questions open. I, I would like to ask, first of all, if there are any, if there is any student or, uh, or anyone in the audience that has some questions for Molly, uh, because I, I took some notes during your presentation and there are so many points that, uh, that I would love to, <laughs> to to discuss and to sure. talk about, uh, but first of all, I, I want to give the word to the audience if anyone has some uh, some questions. I have a question for mm. Mon. I saw uh, hi. I saw um, a video of yours like on YouTube talking about like uh, pneumatic pipes, pneumatic tubes, and actually. I must confess that I didn't even know they existed for real. <laughs> I thought it was just something like about steampunk, comic world, or things like that. But so I was thinking that by now it's like um, um, a concept that uh, is past already. We don't we thinking about like using pneumatic tubes to communicate. It's uh, something like uh, crazy to think, but I, I wanted to ask if maybe we can find some um, technology concept in the past and maybe like rearrange them and uh, use it like in the future. You know, that's a great question and thanks for bringing that up. So yes, there's a history of um, the pneumatic post everywhere. Um, I forget how many cities in, uh, in Italy. I know that there, there was one in Milano uh, maybe Genova, um, and can't remember where else, but, but yeah, there's pneumatic post and it made, when you're dealing, 
when you're dealing with very, very crowded cities and you need to get something across the city quickly, what do you do, right? Um, in the 1880s, you could put tubes underground and send it between the post telegraph offices and then it would come up and you could deliver it. It's a last mile problem. We always have last mile problems when it comes to delivery. But people like uh, Elon, Elon Musk are coming up with the Hyperloop and uh, the Boring Company, the company he founded. So the idea is very much there today. Um, what I think is interesting is this question of contingency. And I think that someone like, um, I feel like Antoine Picon and some of his writings about engineering and even like engineering in the 18th, 19th century might get us there. But I find it really interesting, all the technological things we string together to get a thing done, right? Mm -hmm. Like over the course of your day today, if I were to ask you all of the technologies you'd used, all the interfaces, You've used 20 apps on your phone. You've, you've gone back and forth between a bunch of things. And then, you know, at the same time, maybe maybe you're writing something. You're, I've got like a notebook and I think I have five pads of paper right here in front of me. And then here you are in Italy and my dog is over here. And <laughs> but, but the ways we put them together is really interesting. And um, you know, the, also the ways that we, I think when we're looking at architectural and digital questions, the ways we spatialize things, the ways we we perceive things, the ways that haptics work for us when we're thinking of, of you there and me here, all of those things are both old and new at the same time. So I kind of think that that's what we're always doing. What do you think? Yeah, it's like uh, maybe we, we think about like uh, the future and robots as something like um, futuristic, but also in a, in aesthetic sense. Uh, but maybe it's, it's something that also relies in the in the past. Maybe I don't know. It's like difficult to, to think of it because it's not here yet. So, but maybe the two things can coexist, like some futuristic. Uh, uh, like uh, I don't know Star Wars with like uh, robots, uh, super technological robots, but maybe they can have also like um, a different um, aesthetic. Maybe something that we can find it in the past. What would a robot look like made of wood? What would a robot look like made of um, throwaway materials? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all of these things, I think that those questions do actually get asked in robotics, which is, you know, admittedly not my field, although something I'm a fan of. And um, it's also worth remembering that we've had the word robot since 1921 because of the play R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots, so the Czech play. Um, in fact, here's here's something for you. Um, we the the um, designer Michal Luria um, has a project that is called Medieval Robots. And um, so I've been involved in this a little bit. And it's a, it's a group of people here at Carnegie Mellon that took up the work of Ellie Truitt. She's a, a um, French professor. And she wrote a book called Medieval Robots and explored the ideas of robotics in uh, medieval times and the way they were designed. And, you know, they couldn't have possibly existed, but the ideas are there. And so Michal's research group brought them to life and started designing them. And that question of interpretation of like, what do we use? How do we use it? How do we use contemporary prototyping methods? What what technologies would we use? We ultimately decided that it would be an alabaster room that we would prototype in an elevator of a conference. How does like, what is alabaster like? But we can't afford alabaster, but we do have plastic. So anyway, all of these are to say that all ideas are old and that's why they're awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Play with them though and bring them to life. I mean, this is why where I think um, 
tools from critical design, you know, more recently, uh, the, the work that comes out of the Royal College of Art and the Design Interactions Program, or I've, I've been writing about Super Studio for the last couple of days because Super Studio. Because um, <laughs> today, like with what's going on in my country today, I need Super Studio today. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the way that you bring these possibilities to life and explore them in, in video and in art and gallery and sometimes outside of what a traditional architectural project might look like gives you a lot of possibilities for asking some of these questions with your hands and your brain. Grazie Marco. Thanks. Thank you very much. Molly, I think you are familiar with the work of Kevin Kelly with uh, mm. the book What Technology Wants, right? Mm. Where he says that technology never dies <laughs> effectively yeah. uh, or and uh, like uh, discovery or invention uh, happens uh, at least uh, simultaneously or several times through history. They reinvent or rediscover uh, the same technology as an idea over and over with just different uh, actualization according to the, the available uh, culture, materials, uh, knowledge of the of the age. So I think this resonates with this thing about uh, reconsidering what we call past uh, or the fact that uh, sometimes we associate with the past uh, a sort of uh, adjective or being surpassed or not uh, not being uh, relevant. But in, in, in fact, uh, I mean, the, the, the only linear factor is time. Mm. But the the landscape of opportunities, it's always, uh, uh, I mean, we inevitably are soaked into the paradigm we grew up with. And they are in time influenced by anything that happened uh, in the past. So the way we think about novelty, it's in part uh, uh, biased by our own experiences. Uh, so in a way it is the source and it's the only source through which we build the future in, in a way. But I don't see that in a, in a very linear fashion. I see that in more of a kind of a discovery. First of all, if you want to look forward, you need to know that you are effectively looking in a direction that is not something that somebody else has already uh, treaded on to or already discovered. So you need to look around first of all. It makes me think of the book Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, have you read this? No, uh, I read the uh, other small stories, but uh, yep. not this one. It's uh, oh no, it's actually out in my hallway. Um, I was just writing about that book recently because um, he. It's it's basically the story of someone. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no problem. Um, it's always very exciting. The doorbell rings and the dog freaks out. Um, so Slaughterhouse Five is the the story of um, basically someone returning from World War II and having post traumatic stress disorder. God, they're ringing it again. <laughs> no worries, no worries. All right. Uh, so he has, it, Billy Pilgrim has PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But also it's about his relationship with time in the 20th century. And he has come unstuck in time. This famous statement is, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. And part of this is because he has been kidnapped by space aliens who are called the Tralfamadorians. The Tralfamadorians. Um, are uh, from outer space and um, they, they don't see time the way that you and I do. They see time like a mountain range. And so if someone is dead, they don't get sad because it's just someone is in a less good period, you know? So they just say, so it goes. So anytime that Kurt Vonnegut writes the word dies or dead in the book, he writes, so it goes after it. But this idea of looking at time like a mountain range, not linear, but spatial, experiential, and our ability to play backwards and forwards our own narratives within it. Um, I think that this unstuckness in time is good for us. Yeah, I, I, I want to come to um, 
to another question. I mean, I don't know if the audience has a question, but there is also the fact that, for instance, we are inevitably bound to read the past through new lenses because mm. we have a different uh, cultural bringing generation after generation. So even the, uh, the, the way in which we think about the past uh, evolves. Uh, so even the past is a kind of a magmatic uh, territory, culturally speaking. So I don't see that. Uh, I mean, it's continually reinvented, rewritten. Uh, it's not a singular thing. And the idea that we have about the past continually changes in, in, um, in face of the discoveries and the changes that we undergo. But I, I want to see if anybody else in the audience has other questions. You know, that I also want to point this out. Um, it's always hard to show a book and have it be seen, but this is the uh, mm. dissertation from Maria Joran's daughter mm -hmm. at um, Umeo Institute of Design. So transitional, let's see, here we go. Transitional design histories. Yep. Um, and this is a really interesting dissertation written by somebody who started her PhD studies in the you know mid 90s then became you know the eventual design lead team for the Umeo Institute of Design and then went back to finish her dissertation and she argues that the points that the design pasts we start with and how we interpret them change the design futures that we can have which on one hand sounds completely obvious and yet there are so many radical possibilities in there because which design history, right? Um, and in her work, since she's a historian of design and a historian of, of ideas, she's tending to look at um, certain design histories in Sweden, but doing industrial design histories from the perspective of women, um, from the perspective of sociology. And they make different kinds of possibilities pos um, possible looking ahead. I wrote a book about AI and architecture and it's great and I'm glad I did and now there are new ideas out there that we can deal with and I did not write about the women who were very active in those engagements. I didn't write about Sarah Ishikawa for instance. What would a history look like or what would a future look like that starts from that history? It's different. So I'm very interested in that new kind of question that this dissertation put forward. And I'm looking forward to see what kind of uh, history comes up and what kind of <laughs> possible futures uh, open up from there. I'm always interested in uh, speculation. There is one thing that uh, if uh, there is no other input from the audience, there are several, actually several things, but um, <laughs> There's one thing that um, connects me uh, this discourse about past and future, about a recent tweet that I've seen from Cory Doctorow, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, makes a very interesting um, critique of machine learning. Uh, and it op it op he opens up with the statement that past performance is not, is not indicative of future results. Uh, which uh, also resonates with something that you also point out in your book about data, how data is biased uh, in a way, but we rely very much on that for uh, a lot of aspects in our lives. And also to architecture, I mean, there is a, a huge amount of uh, presumed or supposed objectivity in a lot of aspects uh, that architects deal with. And through which architects, uh, let's say, they dive into those aspects of supposed objectivity head first. And they, they make a lot of assumption on that and they base a lot of, a big part of their project on those assumptions. I would like to know what are your thoughts on, uh, on those and maybe what, uh, what the future can bring uh, in terms of uh, changing this kind of thing. But there, there is a, in this, there is a problematic relation with also how AI is structured today, how machine learning is going today. Yeah, well, data comes from the past. Data does not come from the future. And this is exactly Corey's, Corey's idea. Um, 
And there are a lot of people who do a great job, I think, of writing critically about what what that means, what that um, you know, not least Ruha Benjamin, who points out things like race is a technology, but at the same time, if race is a technology, then data that comes from the past is not going to set us up for what could potentially happen in the future. And if data is objectivity, then it's difficult to question, right? If data is supposed to be objective, and yet we know that it could lead to skewed or racist results, then where does that lead us in the future? Um, how do you get better data? How do you um, how do you get data that uh, considers subject positions? Architects have been very keen on form, of course, and object. And um, then we get you know the whole media theory side of things, which is about format. But I think that when we are ignoring subjects uh, and when we're talking about autonomy and not connection, we, uh, we run the risk of, of a world where we just replicate the same problems. So some people that I really like to look at um, include, I don't know if there's a way that I can type this, can I? Yeah, I think you can type in the chat. Oh, there is chat, you can type it. That. But okay. I, I just run the, I mean, type it please, because then we have uh, the, the exact spelling. Perfect. Mimi Onuaha. Um, check out Mimi Onuaha's work on uncollected data sets. What happens if you don't collect the data? Um, you can't do a study of how many black men are killed, uh, unarmed black men are killed by police officers if you don't collect the data right you can't understand how many women die of a certain kind of cancer if you don't collect the data there is, there is a, a very similar question that is posed for instance by mckenzie work mm -hmm. in uh, i believe i believe she preferred to be called her <laughs> she's yeah mckenzie is a she Yes, exactly. Uh, so she puts this problem forward uh, in, in her book, uh, Molecular Red, uh, when she speaks about climate science. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says that uh, also the data that we have uh, about uh, climate science uh, is problematic uh, because it's collected, it's a huge collection done over time uh, and also in period in which instruments were uh, very unreliable compared to the instruments that we have now, but we rely a lot on, the, on those studies. Yeah. So there is also this aspect uh, about the uncertainty that comes um, uh, with the sciences that are not, let's say, strictly just uh, mathematic, uh, mathematical or theoretical uh, in a mathematical sense, as, as, as long as they meet uh, the, the complexity of um, of the world the, the the problem become complex the borders and and the boundaries become vague and it's really really um, i think it's uh, very very difficult to sustain um or, or let's say to base a position on um, or to make let's say claims of scientific objectivity of a position uh, when you have to deal with uh, with the complexity, uh, both of um, uh, let's say the subject of the social climate uh, uh, that are that are uh, very very um, say actual and uh, relevant concerns uh, uh, right now in our yeah. contemporary age. I am. Um, I had the pleasure last week of interviewing Jennifer Gabris for the opening conversation of Acadia 2020. Um, I just put her her name and two of her works into the, the side, uh, into the conversation window. Um, she studies yeah, how sensors fit into the world around us, how sensors are used for environmental conditions, um, and kind of what this what she calls becoming environmental means, and and what the role of a sensor is in bringing to life that experience. And that that sensing, and it's a really interesting set of things that come together. That it's um, 
a different way of understanding both computation and sense as well as the, the environment. Her book, How to Do Things with Sensors, is available online as an open edition. Okay. Um, so, and it's a bit of a manifesto as well as a little bit of a how-to. And she even thinks about what a how-to book does, what, what that kind of uh, way of, you know, I think of all the explainer videos we watch today and, and all of the little um, kind of, oh, what are they called? Instructables um, that we get for how to, you know, figure something out, wiki how or whatever they are. And, uh, and I think that what she opens up is a way of thinking how we work, how we, the environment and the sensors work back and forth with each other. So highly, highly recommended, really beautiful work that she does. Great. Thank you very much for the reference, by the way. Sure. Amazing. Yeah. If there are no, uh, still no questions from the audience, uh, I'm just pinging <laughs> everyone because I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but of course <laughs> I would have like a ton of things to put on the table, <laughs> but I want to give the yeah, students I the opportunity. Have a yeah, yeah, please, if please. I can. Sure, of course. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, we've talked a lot about this MIT's architecture machine group and mm -hmm. uh, all this university work and research. So my, my question is about Mm, about the university research in this kind of uh, in this for these works uh, and for the AI and the architecture. So, how much is university research uh, important uh, mm -hmm. for this topic? So, um, at that time, fundamental, absolutely necessary. It looks different today. Um, I'll come back to today in just a minute, but at that point in time. Um, there, for research in artificial intelligence, it was especially the Office of Naval Research that was fundamental in putting this together, so much so that there was one man named Marvin Denikoff who worked there, you know, pretty much throughout his whole career, and he's thanked by everybody, Minsky, Negroponte, everybody. He, um, in histories and oral histories of AI, he is the one man who figured out what was going to get funded and how. And everybody really liked him. But like there were a couple of key individuals in these defense offices that were funding university um, research. So I'm realizing you asked me about universities and I answer with defense and that's how tightly connected they were in my mind. In the U.S. at that time, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the, at the beginning of AI, there were, I think, it might be something like seven different centers of excellence. So um, the University of Utah is where important research in computer graphics took place. So Ivan Sutherland was at the University of Utah. Um, Cornell was another angle of computer graphics. Uh, MIT, Carnegie Tech, which is my university, um, Berkeley, Stanford, uh, there might be maybe UCLA, but yeah, something like that. Oops. So, so it was really necessary. And then I think in the 90s that began to shift. And now a lot of that research goes on in corporate settings, but... Um, universities are still really vital sites of research. Um, universities run on research. Um, so one of my jobs is to be a, an associate dean of research and to be more connected to that bigger um, question. Here at my university, we host the National Robotics Engineering Center. We have the Software Enterprise Institute, and this is billions of dollars of research a year. So the, the difference at universities is you're doing basic or applied research, but you haven't tried to commercialize it yet. You might be learning something and you might discover technologies that become patents or that become companies and that might spin out. 
So for instance, um, a couple of blocks from where I live is the National Robotics Engineering Center. And then right next to it is Carnegie Robotics. One is connected to CMU, to my university. The other is the commercialized entity. And um, that gives you an idea of how one kind of relates to each other directly in space. Um, the neighborhood I live in gentrified because of robotics research. So, you know, the person who who brought those different uh, centers here in the 1980s also invested a lot in the neighborhood that I live in. So weird connections also to architecture and robotics in ways we might not think of. Okay, thank you. Anyone else who would like to ask something? I feel like I should have snuck in the pneumatic tubes since that's the first question. <laughs> they are a very curious crowd, but they are a bit shy. Oh, I think everybody feels like that looking at a Zoom screen. The last thing you want to do is speak up. Mm. Well, there will be so many so many things that I would like to, to touch, but well, uh, I don't know if you want, if you have uh, some more time or. Uh, I, uh, have, I have, why don't we take one more question? Okay, okay. Let's see if you have a question from the audience. I like it more when there is a question from the audience, but <laughs> I don't want to force anybody. I just see people's. I I can only see people's initials unless I. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a bit of a sad story that I'm into since the beginning of uh, of this year's course. It's really yeah, weird. You know, right now it's funny. Um, some of the writing that I do is more creative nonfiction. So I've been trying to write about Zoom and and Zoom space. So this morning I was writing about. Um, haptic space and visual perception and uh, the work of um, of Revish, who is a it's a 1937 piece a 1937 article about haptic space and how we perceive what's there and um, I find myself thinking that you know there's there's so much weirdness about this and and all of the things that this is like other things it's a magnifying glass it's a mirror it's a stage, it's a grid. This is why I was writing about Super Studio. Um, mm. You know, it's a continuous monument, except I like Super Studio's version so much more. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's any capitalist critique in this mode. There might be, uh, <laughs> <laughs> ironically speaking, but uh, I mean, yes. Yeah, so, um, well, I. I would like to make a closing questions then uh, with uh, something that it's uh, very much on my mind uh, that um, touches uh, one, uh, one uh, let's say, thread in particular uh, that uh, you, you talk about during this presentation and also in your book uh, with uh, a lot of good architects that were highly influential, that they shaped uh, a lot of the, of the culture uh, of the, that particular uh, part of the discipline, which is uh, architecture and computation, which was a, a very narrow niche in the beginning, but now it has blown up uh, in the contemporary age uh, uh, in, with ramif unsuspected ramification even in the more traditional studios. Uh, but those architects uh, uh, rarely build anything. I would like to add uh, a couple of names to the list from Ernest Neufert, uh, uh, which didn't uh, do any work on computation, but uh, basically shaped the, the profession of the next 60 years no, uh, with, with a single book. Yep. Uh, uh, and uh, Jona Friedman, probably. Uh, to, Absolutely, to Jona Friedman. Um, and, you know, Theodora Bardulis has written beautifully about Jona Friedman. Um, oh, Theodora is going to be my guest uh, one of the next weeks. Theodora is wonderful. Theodora is great. <laughs> Um, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big, 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 enormous fan. Um, it's funny because Daniel Cardoso Jacques introduced Theodora and I to each other when I was doing research, must have been like 2011 or 2012, on the dissertation, which became the book, 
she was finishing her master's thesis. And, um, and the three of us have been good friends, you know, like since that moment, so. Great, but I, I didn't po pose my question actually. I yeah. mean, that was the premise. Yes. The, yeah. the question is uh, how much relevant it is today to do this, the, a similar kind of, to have a similar kind of uh, projective and speculative attitude uh, in uh, in the, the face of uh, what's going on uh, with uh, computation, AI, society, uh, a lot of demand of dealing with problems in the here and now. There's a lot of call for contingency, uh, but a lot of potential in the, in the technology. And uh, maybe, probably, um, what I see personally, it's uh, a huge gap between uh, technology and culture, which is widening up. I mean, we are ill-equipped probably culturally to deal with the progress of technology right now. What do you think about this? Mm. I think that if we, I think we always need to be thinking speculatively. Um, there, there are ways. I, I liked. Um, was it Marco who was my who was the first question? Marco, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I liked that that question of you know what would robots look like made from other materials? What 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 do what is speculation like if if we take something from before and bring it to the present or we look differently in in the present? What might we learn? Um, there are so many different tools. You, looking at the tools of people who do design futures and futuring. My colleague Stuart Candy is always my. Uh, my favorite example. I'm totally biased because he's one of my best friends, but. Oh, please. <laughs> but send, the, send any reference, yes. He, his yes. work is about experiential futures. And so how do you get people to understand different possibilities for futures by experiencing them? He works with the US Council on Mayors. So mayors of cities across the country go through these kinds of experiences. Um, I think that we need speculation to turn over the rocks and see what's under them and come up with ideas that we haven't been fed already. Um, I think we need things that are playful in all of this that engage us because everyone wants us to use a widget and that's fine, but what about our own voices? The thing that makes a, an architect an exciting architect is someone who takes up those questions, uses their imagination gives us something we couldn't have seen differently. And whatever that material is, you know, it's it's up to you. Right now, um, I'm using, we're about to start generating new AI and ethics frameworks using different tools like Futuring and Neural Nets, because why not? What can we learn, you know? What might we see that we haven't seen? And I think of that statement, if you kick a system, the very least you would expect it to do is kick you back. Well, absolutely. <laughs> I, I couldn't hope for a, a better uh, wrap, <laughs> wrap up of uh, of this lecture with you, Molly. Thanks. Thank you very much again. It was a real pleasure, and it was really, really insightful. Even though some concepts, I mean, uh, there were things that I went through myself, but it's still uh, always, always insightful to to hear your perspective. So um, I hope the students uh, experience it uh, the, the same way I did, <laughs> at least, or, uh, or maybe more. I hope they got inspired, first of all. I hope they got uh, curious. So I'm going to throw one thing here. Um, if anyone has questions, that's my email address. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, yeah, I have uh, I I can I anticipated that there are like 43 people uh, here, 46 people, but I have like 70 students overall. So some of them will look at it. So we'll catch you, you might expect a flood of emails. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, at your own, uh, you put yourself. Uh, you go out on a limb here. <laughs> sure, <laughs> so, sure. All right. Well, but, it was great uh, talking to you. It was really great. Thank you very much. Uh, your uh, uh, your attitude got through all uh, for my invitation was amazing. I really like it, and uh, I don't know I'm, if I am equipped to offer you the same in return. I mean, if you want to uh, 
have me as a guest for anything. I don't know if I am uh, actually at the, the if I'm apt to do this, but I hope I can contribute. Oh, uh, definitely. I have ideas, so I will be in Oh, touch. cool, cool. Please, <laughs> please. Uh, I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting. So okay. again, uh, I'll let you go now. Thank you again. Thank you very, very much. The only regret is that I couldn't take maybe you and your husband if you were here to dinner in Bologna. Right. That'd no, be, in Bologna, that, no less. I know. That, okay, that next would be time. the perfect conclusion. But next time we'll try to do this in person. Take care. For sure. You too. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Bye bye. Bene, ragazzi. Ciao a tutti e ci vediamo lunedì su Zoom. Spero che la lezione vi sia piaciuta, vi sia servita e eh, lunedì magari vediamo un po'. Speriamo che vi siate stati ispirati. Ora me ne vado prima che mi cacciano a calci dalla, dalla 8.1. Ciao a tutti.